What's up guys and welcome to today's video. Hope everybody is well. I thought I'd do something a little bit different today. You could call it story time with Uncle Mike, where I'm literally just gonna sit down and talk about my life and how I've got to this point. Where I am today, the 29 year old man that you see right in front of your eyes. This may be an opportunity for you to get to know me a little bit better. It could even inspire you or motivate you a little bit, or it could just bore the hell out of you. I don't really know, but you know what? I've been in this apartment for a while. I'm kind of running out of ideas for videos, so here we are. So let's start off with school. I guess that would make sense to start there. Went to secondary school between the ages of 11 and 17. Went to a place called Leeds Grammar School. Hold tight, Leeds. And it was a decent school. They uh, definitely ironed out the little naughty side of me, which I had when I moved to that school from primary school. I was a little bit of a rascal when I was younger, but they were quite strict there. Obviously at that age, I had no idea what I would be doing with my life. All I was focusing on was just working hard in order to get my grades, which, would hopefully allow me to go to the university which I wanted to go to. So GCSEs, I did all right. I got five A stars, three A's, two B's. A levels got A and two B's, which got me to the university which I wanted to get to, which was, it was a tie between going to Newcastle University or Nottingham University. Now, Nottingham University required me to get two A's and a B. Obviously didn't get that, so second choice was Newcastle but my God, I was glad I went to that university in the end. The reason I chose those two was because they obviously had a good reputation uh, for the degree which I wanted to do, and they had a decent sort of nightlife. Obviously, nightlife is <laughs> very important, or it was certainly for me at the time. Now, the degree I chose was economics and business management. The reason why I chose economics and business management, when I look back, I don't really know why, I just thought it was a respectable degree so that I could then, you know, get a job and work my way up. I guess that's what the majority of people's plans are, certainly what my dad did, and I think that's what my dad had hoped for me to do as well. So that was that. I did good in school, decent, relatively speaking, and I had a lot of fun there. I had an amazing group of friends. We all were quite sporty. We all had a healthy social life, and we all took the piss out of each other, which was essential for remaining humble, I think. So. I appreciate every moment I was in school. Very fond memories, very funny memories. And to this day, I'm still friends with all those guys that I went to school with, which is good, or at least that tight circle, which we had. Next was university, undoubtedly some of the best years of my life, especially second and third year. It could have been a four year stint, but I didn't want to do a placement year. It's just something I wasn't interested in. I just wanted to get university kind of over and done with. I didn't want to drag out for too long. I wanted to get into the real world pretty fast. However, I was a little bit disappointed. My main sort of focus or what I wanted to take from university was how to run a business. I wanted to learn how businesses work and learn how to run one myself because I always had this idea in my head it was something that I was gonna do. But unfortunately, you know, very early on I realized it was not teaching me that. Every time I went to class, a lot of the modules, they were very heavy on the statistics, heavy on the numbers, heavy on the graphs and equations and theory, like business theories. And I just was not interested. And every time I went to classes, I was just questioning, like, when am I ever gonna use this in real life? When am I ever gonna whip out this equation in a conversation? So anyway, university, three years, loved it, done and dusted. I believe I finished around the beginning of June. And that is when, kind of like, you sort of stuck with like, okay, well, what do I do now? You know, a lot of people who finish university, it's the big, well, what now? I had the opportunity to go on a gap year, but I didn't want to take a full year off. I felt as though I would just be bumming about and if I came back, I would have no sort of drive to you know, carry on working. So I thought I'd do a little mini gap year, a couple of months abroad. And that's when I went to Port Venus in Marbella. Reason I went there is because I knew a couple of guys who were working in the nightlife industry. I saw all their posts on Facebook and stuff the year before and I was like, oh my God, that looks like the life. Just like living it up all summer. That is what I wanted to do. So what I was doing that whole summer was basically working in the nightlife industry, I'd already got the job secured before I went out there. The pay was not great. I think it was like 50, no, 50 to 60 euros working from like 10.30 to 3.30 a.m. in the morning. And I was just walking around the streets of Port Venus, basically just trying to get as many people as possible into the clubs, which I was working for. I think it was like, at the time it was like Funky Butter and Seven. And it was interesting because at the time I'd never really approached people. I was always like quite nervous about going up to complete strangers because I'd never really done it before. So what I really liked about that whole experience was it taught me how to approach strangers. It, 
it taught me how to have like a bit of a conversation with them. I was develop my people skills. And also like my, my sales skills, because I was basically trying to sell people the idea that going to this club is going to be the best club. So it was interesting. I enjoyed it and it was fun, particularly 20, 20 years old, I had no responsibility. I was just enjoying myself and getting to know people. Another great thing I learned from that was I actually got a sense of what it was like to live in a different country. And I feel that is massively beneficial. You learn a hell of a lot from doing that. So if any of you guys, teenagers finishing university, get the opportunity to do that, do that. So I feel like I learned more about myself and life in those couple of months than I did, you know, that, uh, compared to a whole year at university. And one thing which I'll never forget is this conversation I had with a group of middle-aged women. I think they were on their head and do, and I was obviously trying to get them to come to one of the clubs. And after chatting to them for a while, you know, they'd obviously realised that I was, you know, relatively intelligent compared to the rest of the reps. And I was quite well-spoken. And one of them just looked at me up and down and said, what are you doing here? Like, you're better than this. And I didn't even have a response to it. I was like, yeah, I guess I'm better than this. Like, what am I doing here? I mean, I guess, yeah, I was 20, 21. You know, it wasn't too bad. It's not like I was 30 years old having a midlife crisis doing this job. But I will never forget that quote. And I, after that, I was always thinking to myself, yes, I am better than this. This is not where I want to be. This is where I want to be. I want to be one of the guys driving around the port in a Porsche with a 10 out of 10 by my side. You know, so that is something which I will never forget. So there I am, Port Banus, having the time of my life, maximum enjoyment, zero responsibility. And then August comes around, results day, where you find out what you got for your degree. This was a little bit of a stink. I was not looking forward to getting these results because I knew deep down that I'd messed up big time. And I remember when I had the exams, the majority of my whole degree was accounted for in third year and they were all like exam based, right? And I remember to this day, I still have dreams about this crap, right? I remember sitting down at my desk, the paper gets put in front of me. These are all essay questions and you get to choose like two out of four, two out of five questions to answer. I remember going through it. First question, no idea. Second question, no idea. Third question, no idea. And the fourth one, no idea. Got the exam paper in front of me, not a clue how to answer any of the questions. Just being like, oh my God, I have messed up big time. I am so unprepared. I just don't know how to answer any of these questions. So I remember just writing it, winging it, making up my own little facts. It was ridiculous. I remember walking out of the exam just thinking, oh my God, what, like, how have I screwed up this badly? So obviously I go to this internet cafe to get my results to log in. And surprise, surprise, I've got a two, three, which is like pretty much the lowest grade you can get before you completely fail. So I passed, I got my degree, but two, three, what the hell are you gonna get with that? I remember obviously my dad was like, so how did you do? What results did you get? You know, him obviously expecting that I'd done half decent. And I remember just the, the, the gutted feeling I had telling him, because obviously he, he, I got my good results at GCSE A level, and then he was hoping the same thing would happen at university, and that I would then have this good degree, good grade, so that it would give me a good chance to get a respectable job. And obviously I'd cocked up, got a crap grade, and he was just like, well, what are you gonna do now? Because he'd obviously gone to school, he'd done well, he'd applied for jobs, Started at the bottom, got to the top. That's what my dad had done. He grafted hard. And he thought I would be doing the same thing. And I was just like, I don't know, I'll figure it out. I've always had this optimism that things will be all right. Things will always, they, they will work themselves out. I'm not gonna stress about it, be worried about it. I'll figure something out and it'll be okay. So he was just like, all right, well, you know, best of luck kind of thing. And that was that. I enjoyed the rest of my summer although probably not as much as I did before I'd found out my grades. Because there was a little bit of panic in the air now. I was like, well, what the hell am I gonna do? Because I, I, I can't start applying for jobs because no one's gonna accept a two, three. You know, there's way, way more people with better grades who are gonna stand a better chance. So I was like, oh, well, yeah, I'll just go with the flow. Anyway, I decided to go back to Newcastle after that 
season in Port Venus. I had the choice of going back to Leeds, but I was like, what, do I want to go back to Leeds and live with my dad? No, I'd rather go back to Newcastle and live with my mates, because I still had some, some local mates that lived there. So, went back there, and I'd managed to kind of scrounge together a couple of jobs. A few things in the nightlife industry, but it wasn't as well paid. And a little bit of modeling on the side. That's when I kind of got into a little bit of modeling. I still get people asking me now, like, oh, how come you didn't get into like the modeling industry? I'll tell you now, anyone who's thinking of going into modeling, there is no money in it. Unless you are a big time male model, there's no money in it. You know, females get paid way more, like four times more, it's ridiculous. And I remember when I went to the shoots, I felt it was very unsatisfying, you know, just kind of posing in front of the camera, trying on clothes. And a lot of the places didn't really want me because I was too big. You know, you look at a lot of male models, they have like an athletic, slim physique. And I did not have that athletic, well, that slimmer physique. Anytime I tried on clothes, my chest just disfigured the shapes of all the clothes. So none of the big clothing companies wanted me. I can't exactly say I had a huge highlight reel from my uh, very short-lived modeling career, but I did actually manage to get on the front cover of this book, a New York Times bestseller. This is pretty funny. God knows how this woman had found me, but I basically uploaded this photo of my face onto Facebook, which got spread around a little bit. And it turns out that this author's friend had seen it and said to her, this is the new front cover of your book. And then she reached out to me had some negotiations with myself and the photographer, I think it was called Chris Davis Specular. And that was that. I was on the front cover of this book, which I think was like a Fifty Shades of Grey kind of book. I never read the book. Uh, not my thing, obviously, but pretty funny. It, it almost opened a door for me to go down a path of book cover modeling, but I thought, <laughs> it's not something I really want to do. I always remember, Obviously, I, I gave the book to you know, friends and family. Um, my grandma got it, and she was like, oh, Michael, I can't wait to read this book. <laughs> I was like, grandma, I probably wouldn't read that book if I was you. It was a little bit explicit. Now, I did not have any desire whatsoever at any point in my life to be working in retail, but I would have taken anything at that time. And it was funny because I was working on the door for one of these nights in Newcastle, Dirties, and uh, that was the name of the night, weird name I know. But I was chatting to this girl, one of my friends, girlfriends, good looking girl. And I was, you know, I was just saying, oh, I just need a real job, I'm sick of doing this, working late nights, being associated with drunk people all the time, it was driving me mad. And she goes, oh, well, have you thought about applying for the position at Hotster? I was like, what? And she says, yeah, we have like a, a manager position, manager and training position where all you need to do is pass the interviews and you just need a degree. Uh, and I was like, you know, what grade do you need? And she goes, oh, it doesn't matter what grade you have, just as long as you have a degree, you'll be fine. You are eligible to apply for this job. And I was like, oh, sweet. So anyway, I went for the interviews, smashed the interviews, and I got the job, which at the time I was pretty happy with because I was 21 years old. A lot of my friends who went to university couldn't get a job at the time. And there I was, with a job which had a decent salary. I think it was like 22K, which, you know, was all right. At that time, I was happy. So anyway, I started working at Hollister, I think it was January 2012. And it was, I guess it was a good job for me at the time. I think one of the perks of working at a place like Hollister is you're surrounded by a lot of youthful people, similar age to me or younger than me. Everyone's kind of like outgoing, fun. So it was a cool working environment. I did learn a lot in the first six months, like how to run a business, uh, how to run a store, how to manage people. So it was quite good. But after that six month period, it did get very stale and very repetitive. I think one of the problems with working for a big company like that is you have no control over anything. You're basically a little pawn. You get orders from the top and you just have to follow orders and do what they say, even though some of the orders just don't make any sense. And obviously the way they employ people, they used to employ people based on their looks not based on their actual intellect and common sense. So you're kind of trying to run a store with a load of kids who don't know what the hell they're doing. So that was obviously hugely frustrating. And I was just stuck in this very dark store all day, every day. Working in Hollister by far taught me that I wanted freedom. I wanted to choose 
when I worked. Okay, I'm willing to work hard, but I just would like to choose when I have time off and when I want to work. But anyway, with each passing month, I got more and more frustrated because I was like, I, I can't be here forever. You know, at that point, the salary hadn't gone up. It was exactly the same. I was like, it would be nice to have a bit more money. You know what I mean? There was no bonuses or anything like that. It was just very frustrating because I didn't know what I was going to do. And it was funny. I remember just walking around the shop floor when it was dead, when no one was there. And just having chats with Louis, Louis Armstrong, my photographer, my current photographer. That was where I met him for the first time. He was one of the guys working on the shop floor. And I got on with him straight away. And I remember we were just walking around, just daydreaming about what we would rather be doing. I remember going back home, just trying to think, okay, so what am I going to do? What am I going to do in my life? Like waiting for this sort of source of inspiration. And I knew at that time I wanted to kind of run my own business. I wanted to do my own thing. I didn't know what it would be. Like I'd contemplated like, setting up a clothing store or like buying and selling shoes obviously it didn't, that didn't happen and it just so happened that one of my housemates at the time had become a personal trainer just got his certification and this had never even occurred to me that it'd be something i would do and i was asking him i was like okay so what you're a personal trainer now like what do you do and he goes well obviously i can just i go to the gym i just train clients and i was watching what he was doing you know, he was choosing his own schedule. He was like choosing who he worked with, set his own fee, you know, fee per hour. And he got to be in the gym all day. And I was like, what the hell, mate? That sounds amazing. Like that's, that's okay, I need to do that. That sounds way better than what I'm doing now. You know, at that time when I was working, the only thing I was actually passionate about was the gym and music. And the fact that I was always working in Hollister in that store, it was annoying me because I couldn't go to the gym when I wanted to. I noticed that when I did go to the gym, I was tired because I'd been at work all day and or like I was trying to go to the gym and my lunch break and it was like rushed 45 minutes. So I was like, yes, that'll give me all the time in the world to go to the gym. That's something I want to do. So at this point, I needed to figure out, okay, how am I going to make this transition from working in Hollister to being a personal trainer? And what I did, I remember this was probably one of, one of the most stressful periods of my life because I needed to take my final vacation days before quitting. So what I did was I took my personal training certification course, which I think lasted for six weeks. And it was like, I had to be there three days out of the week. So I was juggling my course whilst being at work. So I had like no days off for six weeks. And I remember sometimes I would do my course in a day. It was at Northumbria University with a company called Premier. And then when I finished at five o'clock, I would sprint all the way to work and do the night shift at work from like 5.30 to 2.30. Get four or five hours sleep and then go straight to my course the next day. Like it, was, it was exhausting. I remember I had to stop training then. It was like that demanding. But anyway, I'd done my course, got my certification and I quit, handed in my notice. And it was the best feeling in the world. I was completely free. Now at the time, I was in good shape from training and I just assumed that because I was in good shape, everyone would want to train with me. But it didn't work like that. Uh, very quickly, I noticed that, ah, okay, so I really don't have many clients and I'm not earning much money. And I had a little bit of a stash saved up from working at Hollister, which was very quickly being depleted. So I was like, okay, I need to hustle. I need to step my game up. So I, d I went out there, I remember just asking everyone if they wanted a trainer, a coach. Obviously my, my prices were low. You know, I couldn't afford to charge a lot for my hourly rate because I was just desperate for, for something. And slowly I started to pick up a few clients. And the whole art of coaching people, being a good PT, I feel like I picked up pretty quickly. You know, at the time I was doing a lot of learning and research and I had a decent level of knowledge for my own training you know, the, the years which I'd spent in the gym eating and so on. And I think one of the biggest underrated aspects of being a good coach is just your people skills. If you're good with people, you know, they will enjoy the session and they'll often want to come back for more. And then they'll tell their friends as well. Word of mouth by far was the biggest thing which helped me build up my client base. If you do a good job with someone, they enjoy it and they feel as though they're seeing progress, then they're going to tell their friends and then they will tell their friends. So after about six months, I was hustling hard, but I managed to actually get to the point where I was busy 
which was good. So when you're busy, then you start to put your price up a little bit. You may lose a few clients, but you know, you don't lose much money. And then those people that are willing to pay more, they pay more. So that was all good. I was enjoying my life hell of a lot more than when I was working at Hollister because I had the freedom to set my own hours. I was in the gym. I liked being in the gym and uh, I could actually devote a lot more time and attention to building my own physique. I feel that's when my physique really stepped up to the next level. Biggest drawback at that time, I think, was because I was training at another gym, I spent a lot of time driving backwards and forwards because I had clients in the morning, some clients in the evening. Uh, it wasn't exactly a prestige gym. It was a bit rough around the edges. There was some of you know, the, the high-end clients didn't really like going there and it was always busy. So when it's like noisy and busy, it was more difficult to train clients there. And that was when I realized, oh, you know, it'd be a hell of a lot better to have my own place, my own studio. And my friend who I was working alongside, who actually inspired me to get my certification in the first place, he was thinking the same thing. So we decided to sort of team up together, put some money together and set up our own studio. Now I could probably do a whole other video on the story of me setting up my gym and the, the experiences I had there. What I realized from running a gym was that my skills were not necessarily in gym running, gym management, and setting up gyms around the country. Because at one point I thought that was something I was gonna do. I thought I was gonna have my own chain of gyms, which I guess could have been possible, but that wasn't what my passion was. I wouldn't say it was my strength. I think the biggest eye-opener during that period of time, I think it was, I had that gym for about three years, up until about 2016. My calling was the social media side of things, the, the YouTube, Instagram, that kind of thing. So after a few years of doing that, this was up until 2016, it got to the point, me and my business partner, you know, we had our differences, we wanted to take the company in different directions. And to be honest with you, I was just a little bit sick of being stuck in one place all the time. I, I wanted to travel, see the world. And the only way that would have allowed me to do that is if I had set up an online platform where I could be anywhere in the world and still do my job. So that was that. That was the end of Aurora Athletic. That was the name of the company. And I decided to myself, I need to get out of the city, the city of Newcastle, as much as I love it, uh, it was too small for me. It was like a little fishbowl, like everyone knows everyone. Not a huge amount of opportunity. I needed to be in a bigger city. And I'd been to London a few times and I remember every time I went to London, I was just like, I got a buzz every time I went there. I was like, this is a sick place. Like there was, there's so much going on. Like, I was so inspired. So I decided that's where I need to go next. London is the place for me. And it was another big risk. So, you know, the, the previous big risk I had beforehand was me quitting Hollister and becoming a personal trainer. The next one was leaving my gym behind, leaving all my clients behind, moving to London and starting from scratch. I think all I had at that point in time was just a, a, a supplement sponsor, EHP Labs. They were, I think it was like, I was on like a thousand dollars a month, something like that. So I had that as a, like a little bit of a backup. Uh, but rent in London is not cheap. So as soon as I moved down there, I was like, okay, I need to step my game up. And that was when I set up my own website, mikepherson.co.uk. Started all my online services, like online coaching, you know, customized programming, training, nutrition, Skype calls, all that kind of thing. And main focus was obviously YouTube. I knew I needed to make videos and pump videos out there, but I never really saw it as a money maker. I just saw it as a way to build a following and advertise my services. Yeah, I didn't even know you could monetize it until I think a year into me making videos. Someone said, oh, you know you can make money off videos. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, you can make money off videos. You need to monetize them. I was like, what the hell does that mean? And obviously I went and looked and I realized that when you publish a video, you click monetize. That means adverts come on your videos and you can make money. And I was like, oh, well, that's annoying because I'd already racked up a few million views by that point and I didn't make any money off it. So that was that. Year of 2017, that was a year where I just completely focused on growing my YouTube channel. Didn't really have much of a social life, didn't really travel or do anything to be honest. I had a girlfriend who was based in Sweden and my sort of free time was when she came over or I went over to see her. The rest of the time I was like, you know, coaching my clients and putting YouTube videos together. Obviously it was hard work, but the hard work paid off. YouTube channel grew, started to make some decent money off of YouTube, got more clients, could charge more for my online services, and I was able to negotiate more 
deals with brands. You know, I think I signed up with Bulk Powders, managed to work with a few of the brands as a one-off, and that allowed me to kind of upgrade to a nicer apartment in Earl's Court, which was more central. It was way nicer apartment, actually. That was, that was a big game changer. And then I spent another year in that apartment, so that was all 2019. But to be honest with you, a third of that year, I wasn't even there. I was traveling all over the place. I think with all everything that's going on now, I'm very glad I did do that much traveling because it wasn't really going to be much traveling occurring this year. 2019, one of the biggest highlights was obviously launching Thirst, the clothing line. And end of that year, obviously moved to Dubai. Obviously, I'd, I'd done my time in London, I had three years in London. I wanted to be somewhere different. Another big city, another exciting city, but Obviously, I came to Dubai mostly for the weather. I guess the biggest lessons which you could take from this, or which really stand out to me, would be if you're unhappy with something, change it. You know, nobody's going to change the situation for you. You are responsible for doing that. And you can't just sit there and complain and want to be in a better position and do nothing about it. You have to go out there and take action. Second one. Take risks, do not be afraid of taking risks. The biggest leaps in my life have come from taking risks. And the last one, just keep telling yourself that you deserve better. If you feel as though you deserve better and that you should be on this level, living this life, a life that you deserve, you will figure out a way how to achieve it. If you sit there and you're content, you know, being in a one bedroom house in a scruffy area with a crappy job and a mediocre girlfriend, then that is how it's gonna be, it's not gonna change. But if you want more for yourself, if you think you deserve better, then you will just not sit there and be content with it. You're gonna work your ass off to create change. So that is that, that is a little bit of an insight into my story and how I've got to where I am today. If you are still with me and you're still watching, thanks for watching all of it, much appreciated. Give it a thumbs up if you have enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to providing you with many more videos to come. And hopefully this situation will all be resolved and we can get back to some sense of normality sooner rather than later. See you guys soon.